Good morning and welcome to the Wilson Center. My name is Benjamin Gadan. I direct our Latin America program here. I'm thrilled to be partnering today with our colleagues in the Wilson Center's Global Europe program, with the Spanish Embassy in Washington, the Deputy Chief of Mission is here to my left, and with the Atlantic Council's Adrian Arsh Latin American Center. A special thanks to my colleague Jason Marzak, who directs that program, who's here and will be delivering closing remarks. The Spanish EU presidency has sharpened the European Union's focus on Latin America. That was clear in July in the summit in Brussels, which brought together European and Latin American and Caribbean leaders. At the meeting, the first of its kind in eight years, the EU announced 45 billion euros in planned investments in infrastructure in the Americas through its Global Gateway Program, and it committed to holding similar summits every year, including to address shared environmental issues. This greater European focus on Latin America has created a historic opportunity for the United States and EU to deepen their partnerships in the Western Hemisphere. After all, the US and EU share a wide range of values and national in this strategic region. Both recognize the region's vulnerabilities, including an unprecedented migration crisis, the intensifying impacts of climate change, and widespread disillusionment with traditional political parties and public institutions. <clears throat> to encourage deeper transatlantic cooperation in the Americas, our Latin America program and our partners have been hosting a series of public and private conversations throughout Spain's presidency of the Council of Europe, where we've been addressing issues including US-EU partnerships on commercial issues, as well as joint efforts to defend democracy in the Americas. This is the last dialogue in the series, but it is not the last time we'll be encouraging greater US-EU cooperation in the region, as Jason and our other colleagues at the Atlantic Council will tell you as well, I hope. Indeed, our goal is to build upon the recommendations and lessons that we have drawn from these public and private conversations to help build permanent structures in Washington and elsewhere to shape and promote continual, permanent, and deep transatlantic cooperation on issues in the Western Hemisphere. Today's topic, environmental protection, is to me an obvious area for greater EU-US partnerships in Latin America and the Caribbean. Indeed, this region is one of the most biodiverse in the world, home to more than a third of the world's species in a variety of habitats, including lowland forests and high altitude grasslands in the Andes Mountains. The Amazon, of course, is the planet's largest tropical rainforest, habitat for a kaleidoscope of mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles, and freshwater fish. I've had the privilege to experience a few of these stunning places, from the glaciers in Argentina's Santa Cruz province and penguin habitats in Chile and Patagonia, to blue-footed booby colonies in the Galapagos in Ecuador, and the tropical waters off Panama's Contadora Island teeming with nurse sharks and parrotfish. These natural spaces are worth saving for their inestimable beauty, for their economic value, and for the families that directly depend upon them, including an indigenous and Afro Latin American Afro-descendant communities. Sadly, the biodiversity in this region is under terrible strain from unsustainable farming and ranching, from pollution, from illicit mining and logging, and from illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. Rapid deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon under the last government in Brasilia drew worldwide condemnation, but it is hardly the only example of dramatic forest loss in this hemisphere. At the same time, Latin Americans and their leaders are increasingly open to international partnerships to safeguard their natural spaces and to help the region play a leading role in the global energy transition. Encouragingly, most Latin Americans regard climate change as a serious threat and countries in the Caribbean tormented by sea level rise and more frequent and intense storms are global leaders on climate action. In South America, nations such as Chile and Colombia have made ambitious pledges to move away from fossil fuels Uruguay has already done so. The recent and historic Escasu Agreement mandates better access to information on the environmental impact of development projects and commits signatories to protect environmental defenders. At sea, Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, and Panama have joined together to protect the eastern tropical Pacific. Argentina and Chile are hoping to do the same in the southern ocean around Antarctica. Ecuador has showcased new types of green financing to pay for conservation, including in the Galapagos. Chile and Panama have both hosted the Global Air Ocean Conference, 
In 2025, Brazil will host COP30, the UN Climate Conference, and next year, Brazil will preside over the G20 and will no doubt bring issues of sustainability to that important global forum. But the political will and support for environmental conservation in Latin American public spaces are not enough, not without significant new international support. The United States and the EU are the right partners for the job. US and European leaders share the region's desire to urgently address the climate and biodiversity crises. Importantly, they both have leverage as major trading partners interested in reducing the environmental impacts of the products they import from this region. Just as importantly, they are longtime committed friends of Latin America and the Caribbean, and both have the capacity to provide technical and material support necessary to help governments design implement and enforce environmental protection strategies and to provide the diplomatic recognition and rewards to the governments that commit to doing so. Finally, both the United States and the EU understand that environmental protection ultimately depends upon strengthening the rule of law in Latin America to enforce effectively environmental rules. Today's dialogue will explore ways the US and EU could better protect Latin America's unequaled biodiversity both at sea and in its forests, and accelerate the region's energy transition. I'm excited to hear about existing EU and US support for environmental conservation in the Americas, about new possibilities for US and EU engagement, and about ways the United States and EU could better coordinate these efforts to increase their impacts. I wanna thank you for your participation in today's conversation, both those of you in the room today and the many of you following us online. I'll now turn to our terrific moderator, Manuel Carmona Yebra, Counselor for Environment and Oceans for the European Union Delegation to the United States, who will introduce our terrific panelists. Thank you again for being here. Hi, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, but before we begin with the panel, I would like to give the word, if that's uh, uh, possible, uh, for an introduction of the Spanish Embassy, who has been part, uh, we've been cooperating with uh, on, on, uh, on this event uh, and on this program and generally on our activities, of course, in the EU uh, concerning Latin America and the Caribbean. So I would like to give the word to uh, Pablo Sanz, the Deputy Chief of Mission uh, of the Spanish Embassy here in Washington, D.C. Pablo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Manuel, and thank you, thank you Ben. Um, it's an honor for the Embassy of Spain uh, to co-sponsor this event. Uh, within the framework of the uh, Spanish uh, presidency of the Council of the European Union. Um, as Ben said, uh, this event is part of a cycle of uh, activities on Latin American and the Caribbean uh, that we are conducting in partnership with the Wilson Center, the Adrian Arch uh, American Latin America Center of the Atlantic Council, and the EU delegation um, here in Washington. Um, one of the four priorities of the Spanish presidency of the, of the Council of the European Union is advancing in the green transition and strengthening environmental protection. Um, and on the other hand, uh, Spain has worked uh, to revitalize the relationship between the EU and uh, Latin America. So uh, last July, we held uh, the EU Select Summit uh, setting a roadmap for a bilateral uh, sorry, for by regional engagement through 2025. And uh, at the summit, uh, as uh, Ben uh, mentioned, there was a, a big announcement of 45 billion worth of European investment in Latin America and the Caribbean as part of the EU Global Gateway Initiative. Um, also, we are witnessing serious coordinated efforts to address uh, climate change in the region through adaptation and multi-stakeholder uh, initiatives like the Amazon Fund launched by the Inter-American Development Bank and uh, Euroclima along with France and Germany. Um, in today's open discussion, we will have the opportunity to know also about uh, what the Spanish cooperation is doing to enhance environmental protection in the region through a regional office located in Costa Rica, which is dedicated exclusively to promote a sustainable development. Um, I must say that for Europeans, uh, carbon climate change and environmental degradation is not only a legal and moral obligation, it is also a huge opportunity. If we execute it well, the green transition will allow us to drastically reduce our dependence on energy and raw materials lower our electricity bill, make our companies more competitive, and create nearly one million jobs in this decade alone. 
So let me thank again uh, the Wilson Center for hosting this event in coordination with the Atlantic Council. And uh, special thanks to all the panelists, especially uh, for Helga, who uh, came all the way from Brussels uh, to join us today. And I wish you a fruitful and engaging, engaging discussion. So thank you. Thank you so much, Pablo. Um, right, so we have one hour ahead of us of interesting discussions. We're going to jump right into it. Thank you for being here. Thank you for those online that are listening to this. Um, I'm going to first introduce our excellent panelists one by one, and then I'll, I'll put a question to each, to each of them. Uh, first off, to my left, Helga Zeitler. Uh, Helga is the deputy head uh, of UNIT at the European Commission, Director General for Environment, for the issues of planetary common goods, universal values, and environmental security. But in reality, she deals a lot with water and deforestation, you know, just to translate a bit the, the, the title. <laughs> um, then we have um, online, uh, Rafael, perhaps Rafael, do you hear us? I'm hoping that he does, maybe Con buenos días, les escucho perfectamente. Un saludo desde San José de Costa Rica, que es donde se uh, ubica nuestra oficina regional. Excellent. So Rafael Garcia Fernandez is, is joining us from Costa Rica. Uh, he's head of the regional office for environment and climate change of the Spanish Cooperation Agency in Latin America. Uh, again online, joining us as well, I'm going to do the same check, is Sofia Martinez. Sofia, can you hear us? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Excellent. Sofia, thank you so much for, for joining us. Sofia, uh, joining us from Spain, is a global policy director of the Green Economy Coalition. And uh, finally, we have another person, another panelist uh, here in person. Uh, so two in person, two online. Uh, here to my left as well. Uh, Max Bello, Senior Advisor for Mission Blue and Latin American Program Global Fellow at the Wilson Center. So let's let's kick it then. Let's let's kick off with um, um, with a question to, to Helge first, uh, if that's okay. So Helge, um, we've heard about the deforestation regulation, we've heard about uh, issues that the EU is doing uh, to, to help Latin American countries protect uh, their, their natural capital, notably the Amazon basin. So what role does the EU play generally, but also specifically with the EU deforestation regulation? Thank you very much and, and good morning. Really nice to be here in person. It's always making a difference and uh, so thanks again for everyone who organized for, for set, putting this together. Um, yeah, I think a lot has been said already in the introduction about the significance of, of the region for um, climate and environment and I, I think it's also really the connection with stability and peace that is really relevant. I mean, if you look at Colombia, for example, I mean, we know how, how important this link is and has always been. And so for us, investing in climate and environment has a significance that really goes beyond the issues itself and our climate and biodiversity objectives. Um, the, inform, um, the, the famous EU deforestation regulation that you may have heard about um, that puts a market access requirement of products that are particularly relevant in the context of deforestation, in particular soy, beef, um, palm oil, cocoa, coffee. This regulation requires um, that the, the products are produced in a way that is both legal and deforestation free. And that is a new legislation that has just come into force. It will start to apply from the end of next year. And the background on how this all came about is really that deforestation, including in the Amazon, but not only, but globally, is driven to the largest extent by agricultural conversion. I think we may see a bit of shift of numbers now with the increased mining activities in the, in the rush for critical raw materials, but um, figures really in the last year showed up, up to 90% is stemming from this type of agricultural conversion. And this is both often illegal, but also often legal. And therefore, if we really wanted to make a difference and, and look at the way that our consumption of these products impacts on global um, forest situation, we had to um, look at a, an ambition of halting all deforestation. It's an ambition that stems already from the Sustainable Development Goals, so shared by all in principle. 
Um, but still, it's a new step. Um, so far, all efforts have always focused on addressing illegal deforestation only. Our regulation goes broader and requires for all products um, to be deforestation free. Um, this is now a very important period. Uh, the bit more than a year ahead is where everybody needs to get ready. ready. These are supply chain issues. So while the legal obligations are on those who want to um, put the products on the EU market, of course, all those in the supply chain, including the producers in Latin America, for example, need to contribute. And they, for example, have to provide the information on where exactly the product was produced so that this can be passed on. So this is an innovative piece of legislation. It's one that has caused a lot of reactions, positive, more critical. Um, we see a whole variety and many different voices, a very nuanced picture in all the countries, really. Um, private sector is pragmatic, is getting ready. Um, governments see it more from a political angle, and the foreign ministry is still more critical. Other ministries very positive, in particular the environmental ones. Um, indigenous peoples with very positive reactions, because there's also an element of, of looking, for example, on free and prior informed consent that needs to be done, and that was a very, very important issue for them. So um, we are very actively working, including with all the countries in the region, to see that they can all get ready, because we don't want this to be an obstacle to trade. We want this to be a, a tool that can help countries transition to a more sustainable agricultural um, production. Um, but of course, this is also just a part of the picture. I mean, we've been working very actively with many of the countries from the region in the context of the Bio Biological Diversity Convention and the Global Biodiversity Framework on the so-called 30 by 30 targets, so the protected areas. But we also work very actively with them in, in looking how can one make money out of forests in a sustainable way. We are about to conclude a forest partnership, for example, with Honduras that focuses exactly on that. Um, the bioeconomy will be a focus of the G20 presidency of Brazil. So how can we make that bioeconomy sustainable and circular? That's a big ambition from our side to, to work with Brazil on that. And I think that's also an area where, where the US has, has uh, a strong interest and, and could be a really important partner. Um, then, of course, how can we ensure food security? So how can we sustainably intensify the production on the land that is outside the forests? Because we may need to produce more, but how can we do that without cutting trees? And then I think that was a point that I always find extremely important. There's also this element of, of, of the Escazú agreement or of, of the democracy, the rule of law in the area of environment. How can we enable local communities to, to have a voice, to have the necessary information, to be able to go to the courts? So the Escazú agreement is really a milestone from our perspective. It's very similar to an EU um, convention, Aarhus Convention, um, and we are very happy to see this coming into force. And the situation is dramatic for our environmental rights defenders in the region. I mean, it remains sadly really the, the region with most um, killings of, of people who defend their, their rights to land and, and the forest. And so this is another area that I, I wanted to highlight because I think they are also very aligned with the US on, on how it can we protect these people and how can we really make sure they can have a voice in the discussions. Um, we've done a lot in, in financial support. Um, Euroclima was already mentioned. I mean, this is um, since 2017, I think 250 million going to 18 countries in the region on a lot of, of related projects on biodiversity and climate. We have now a lot of, of Amazon focused um, support again to both sustainable supply chains for sustainable bioeconomy and for forest protection and forest governance. And the Amazon Fund was also mentioned where we will contribute. Um, for us now, the month ahead, of course, are extremely important. Um, we have the Mercosur agreement negotiations in hopefully the final phase. I think there's a strong will from <coughs> both sides, at least um, so far, um, to come to agreement um, till the end of the year. And I mean, the, the discussion around deforestation is really at the heart. Um, so we, we, can ho we hope we can make it happen. We see a lot of political will to make it happen. So fingers crossed. And um, if it comes to the cooperation with the US, just a final word. I think we are 
very aligned on many issues. We just maybe have to still figure out how we translate that more effectively in the plurilateral fora like the G20 and also multilateral fora where these issues are being discussed. And um, then, of course, on the ground, um, projects pulling in the same direction. Donor coordination is important, but I think really still at the strategic political level, there's, there's room to improve. And I'm, I'm curious to hear what your thoughts on this. Thank you. Thank you, Helga. Indeed, you, you raised a number of important issues there. Of course, in the, in the EU delegation, I, I try to cooperate with the United States in the way we're going to go about the uh, deforestation regulation. And uh, the U.S. is certainly very strong uh, in, in fighting uh, global deforestation, but the, the EU is a kind of paradigm shift, really. We really go a step beyond in terms of innovating, in terms of bringing new things to the table. So it's part of my job, of course, as well, to, to ensure that this cooperation with the U.S., which is crucial, goes ahead. But I'm not going to go into what I do. Uh, uh, no, uh, you mentioned also a very interesting thing, which really segues us into, into the next, uh, into the next uh, question to Rafael. Uh, it's about how the EU and the member states are actually cooperating in this new Team Europe approach that, uh, that we, uh, we bound in Europe. Rafael. Uh, this is a question for you. How is the EU working better with member states uh, at the moment in, in Latin America? The floor is yours. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Manuel. Efectivamente, creo que mi intervención va a ser muy complementaria a la de Edgar, eh, eh, porque precisamente el enfoque equipo Europa ha dado un paso a un nuevo paradigma en la cooperación europea para working better together. Eh, Europa eh, es uno de los principales eh, donantes mundiales y en el caso de eh, Latinoamérica también uno de los principales donantes eh, ambientales. ¿no? Eh, ahí ya se ha mencionado el espíritu de las eh, Team Europe Initiatives que definitivamente bajo un, una misma visión, un, unos mismos objetivos y un mismo sistema de resultados e indicadores, todos los Estados miembros, las agencias de cooperación, los bancos de, eh, de desarrollo europeos y, por supuesto, también cada vez más el sector privado, están invirtiendo, apoyando con todas sus capacidades, no solo financieras, sino también técnicas, en la misma dirección. Por mencionar solo algunos ejemplos, la uh, Team Europe Initiative Verde, que le llamamos para la transición ecológica, reúne en estos momentos una cartera de alrededor de 4.800 millones de euros, de las cuales, por cierto, España aporta eh, alrededor de 400 millones. ¿no? En, en ese sentido, también hay, digamos, ma, eh, Team Europe muy especializadas, las, que, las hay temáticas y las hay también eh, regionales y subregionales. Me estoy refiriendo, por ejemplo, haciendo referencia a, la, a las palabras del anterior panel, panelista, a la Team Europe eh, Grandes Bosques de Mesoamérica, una Team Europe en la que varias agencias hemos estado trabajando con la Delegación Regional de la Unión Europea y que precisamente va a trabajar en la gobernanza de los bosques, el monitoreo de los bosques, para que haya herramientas que puedan llegar a las manos de los productores y de las comunidades locales e indígenas para que puedan ejercer la trazabilidad de sus productos, que puedan probar que efectivamente todos esos productos que están exportando a Europa u otras partes del mundo están libres de deforestación. Y en ese sentido también se van a abordar, y ahí la cooperación española tiene un importante papel, toda la gobernanza junto con los gobiernos nacionales de los bosques. En nuestro caso, vamos a seguir trabajando en el enfoque de reservas de la biosfera, ya que los grandes bosques eh, de mesoamericanos son a la vez reservas de la biosfera y tienen eh, grandes comunidades culturales que son sus verdaderos eh, propietarios. Eh, la cooperación española opera a través de un programa regional de medio ambiente y cambio climático que se gestiona desde mi oficina con las 17 oficinas que tenemos en la región, que se llama Programa Arauclima. Este programa lleva operando desde hace una década y está concentrado en varias líneas. Las líneas, obviamente, de la acción climática, como es la agricultura resiliente, la gestión de riesgos, la gestión integral de recursos hídricos, las energías renovables, la eficiencia energética, ciudades sostenibles y, por supuesto, gestión de los bosques, 
integral y conservación de la biodiversidad. Pero no estamos fuera de la Agenda Azul. Precisamente eh, eh, vamos a anunciar en la próxima conferencia de las partes en Dubái, la COP28, vamos a anunciar un importante apoyo a esa área protegida marina que ha mencionado el primer ponente, que va desde la isla de Coco en Costa Rica hasta las Islas Galápagos en Ecuador. Vamos a hacer un apoyo muy sustancial precisamente para apoyar a, cons a consolidar toda esa alianza, toda esa área protegida y para que se cree la primera reserva de la biosfera oceánica internacional. En este caso eh, va a ser una iniciativa pionera que estamos seguros que va a ser continuada por muchos por muchos donantes. Y en ese sentido, pues eh, también eh, hacemos obviamente programas con los países, aunque la vocación del programa Arauclima es multipaís y regional. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Rafael. Um... A lot of interesting thoughts there, uh, particularly in the oceans, uh, the first uh, biosphere um, uh, reserve, um, putting that into the context of the high seas treaty, for example, and the implementation that will bring in the high seas as well these, these uh, uh, protected areas. So, so a lot of uh, cross-fertilization with more global, uh, more global issues. Very interesting. Um, of course, we've talked about governance as well. Rafael uh, uh, alluded to that. Um, I would like to bring in Sofia now uh, because, of course, you know, we, we've touched upon a number of governance on how cooperation uh, is, is uh, happening in the field and how the EU member states and the EU is, is, are collaborating better on this. Um, but, Sofia, um, at the end of the day, we need to have clarity as to what are the objectives that, that we want to, to achieve here in Latin America and the, and, the Caribbean, and the Caribbean, not only from the EU and the US side, but obviously and primarily from the, from the side of the own countries of Latin America and the Caribbean. So my question to you, Sofia, is what, what are the priorities uh, for the preservation of nature in, in the region, uh, according to the Green Economy Coalition? Floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Manuel. Um, thank you for inviting me. I'm very sorry I cannot join you in, in Washington, but it's it's a pleasure to, to join you virtually from, from Madrid. Just a brief introduction. The Green Economy Coalition, it's the largest movement for uh, fair and green economies worldwide. We have 60 members and 10 hubs around the world. Uh, one of them in Peru, another one in Brazil, and another one in Trinidad and Tobago, which is also regional for the Caribbean, and the one in Brazil is regional for the Amazon. So our our mission is to promote a green and fair economy. We can do green, but it might not be fair. Um, we can do fair, but it might not be green. So we try also to reconcile uh, the two agendas and to bring them uh, together bringing the voices of the civil society. And the civil society obviously includes the private sector, the small companies, the, the small farmers uh, the, the, that are dependent, the livelihoods is dependent on nature. And in the case of Latin America, I think it's, it's fundamental. A lot have been said by, by the previous panelists and, and by the introduction, so I'm not going to focus on that. And I'm not going to stress the need to, to, transit, to, to this transformation to a green economy uh, because we all know the many challenges, the many, the many issues that we are facing, but this is a global challenge. So we can think regionally and nationally, et cetera, but we need to have a common understanding. And, uh, and this is also in line with what has been presented. The EU and the US are clearly leading the way in, and, and they are very complementary, but we cannot be fighting against each other it's finding the complementarities and, and, and moving the global economy into the right direction. So that's why we are also calling for, for a new eco-social contract, trying to bridge the two worlds between the green policies and the social policies that sometimes they don't talk to each other. So it's also giving the opportunity to, to those that usually their voices are not heard, that they, they, they can also participate in these dialogues and their visions and taking into account. And this is not anything new. I mean, the, the, the notion of, I think, of a social contract, it was raised by, by Antonio Guterres uh, a while ago already. And it's uh, it's been clearly uh, showcased in different sectors. Probably the energy sector is, is the one that is not advanced in the sense of the notion of just transition that probably everyone in the room and online will be very familiar with. 
And it's uh, that's that's why we need to have this type of dialogues. The EU is also very well advanced, but not only the EU. This is happening elsewhere. This is happening in Brazil. This is happening in South Africa. There is the citizen assemblies, dialogues, are different mechanisms that can be used to to promote this transformation and to value nature in the sense that we cannot. Uh, allow nature to be destroyed is offering us so many advantages, economic advantages as well, but also social advantages. So um, we are not going to tackle climate change unless we tackle biodiversity loss. So it's kind of uh, driving this, these two agendas together and, uh, and changing behavior, values and, and structures. So we need to have this multi-level approach in, in the region where, where there, are, there are already many existing dialogues that maybe they are not talking to each other, like also breaking the silences between different sectors that mention uh, energy as an obvious sector. That is also the notion of critical minerals that is kind of now the hype everywhere uh, when we talk about uh, the green transformation. And it's uh, it, it will have a, a, a great impact in, in, in biodiversity and the preservation of nature could also mean uh, oil or gas and, and I think that here the picture could be very promising but at the same time is uh, very alarming when we hear uh, some uh, perspectives of uh, exploiting uh, fossil fuels in the Amazon for instance so it's 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 something that has to be very very much taken into account and uh, uh, of course uh, Helge has already mentioned deforestation and and this is such a critical issue. Uh, and and again, is this type of legislation that is protecting the the societies and the most vulnerable and affected by them? So we are kind of proposing uh, the discussion around five themes: is the governance, is the finance. We need to have finance to to promote these approaches, and the finance have to go to the right sector. So it has to be green. So taxonomies are, are very important. And uh, Helge has also mentioned the G20 and the Brazil presidency. And Brazil is currently studying a new taxonomy, like the EU has done, that many countries uh, have already done. Uh, other countries are taking a different approach. So it's it's kind of different depending on the country. Then it's the different sectors that have to be involved in order to protect people and to protect nature. So this transformation has to be fair and, and sustainable for all. And just a Brief because I think I'm, I'm, it's taking too long uh, to to go a bit into the D2021 presidency uh, now with the African Union Commission taking a seat in the 21 and then also in a bioeconomy. Um, from from our perspective, green covers bioeconomy, circular, and 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 uh, it's kind of a broader framework. So it's it's important to reinforce the different terminologies and putting nature and people at the center of all of all these activities because there are many uh, many many synergies between the the different agendas. And I will stop now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophia. Um, you really brought in a, a, a number of, of key issues, uh, circular economy in the, in the last words that you have, but also the social contract. I mean, the, the, the fact that protecting nature is not for nature itself, which is sufficiently important, but it's also for people that directly depend on the on the health of ecosystems. We're not talking here about uh, a different planet. It's the same planet for both the economy, for nature, and for the people that directly depend uh, on, on it. And ultimately, every one of us de depends on it directly or indirectly. Now, um, I would like to um, finalize the intervention, the first intervention by our panelists uh, with, with Max. Uh, Max, we're now going into the sea, uh, uh, into the ocean, into the blue. So could you tell us precisely what is Mission Blue, uh, where you're working, and how it is helping uh, to protect oceans in Latin America and the Caribbean? The floor is yours. Thank you so much, and thank you for the invitation to the Wilson Center. I think Benjamin did a, a great job on uh, introducing um, this discussion. Um, I think the wealth of Latin America, it's nature. Um, and, and, I, and I think we're starting to see it in a, in a different way, but it's still a long way uh, to go. Um, at Mission Blue, we, um, you know, this is an organization created by Sylvia Earle, 
if if you don't know her, you you should, and maybe you should look at the Netflix Mission Blue movie, and it will give you an idea. She's 88 years old. She's the most famous um, marine biologist, but she's been a witness of what is going on in the ocean, and what we have seen um, it is. Uh, absolutely um, terrifying in many ways, but at the same time also we have seen in particular in the region an increasing um, hope for um, a different sort of uh, way to see the ocean. We've seen Latin America as a leader of uh, marine conservation. Uh, we just talked about the Eastern Tropical Pacific, uh, which is an area where we first have seen this incredible um, joining coming together of uh, four countries, um, Panama, Ecuador, Costa Rica, and Colombia, which ha are now working together to create a corridor of protected areas, to protect something that has been existing there for millions of years. And this is critical also to understand that not only marine protected areas are key. Marine protected areas play a role, but they're not the silver bullet. We need to work in other ways. And this is where US and the EU are critical to it. Um, just look at the, at the region and all the problems that are facing. But we know that actually the main threat to the ocean, it is overfishing, uh, the loss of biodiversity. We have the triple sort of um, um, uh, threat around the world the loss of biodiversity, the climate change, and also the pollution. Um, and the, in the case of the loss of biodiversity, as I said, is overfishing the main source of it. And the main source of this is industrial fishing. We have now enablers, uh, very important enablers this just last few months. We have um, a new agreement for a 30 by 30. Um, it was mentioned by Helga. The 30 by 30 new contract with nature, land and ocean 30% protected. And it is key that those protections are highly and fully, which are the golden sort of standard for marine conservation. We need more highly and fully protection. Only 3% of the ocean around the world, it is, it's being protected that way. Many of the marine protected areas, you still can fish, you still can mine even. So we need to increase the quality. And with our partners, the Pew uh, Bertarelli Ocean Legacy, we've been working on trying to actually get a more ambitious sort of goal on this regard. We have the BBNJ. It was mentioned by Manuel. The BBNJ is the new agreement for protection and many other things but protection or creating marine protected areas in the high seas. This is a very key element. Almost half of the planet, it's high seas. And so we need to connect this with the needs of nature protection, but nature solutions for a better uh, planet. We have also an agreement finally on the um, uh, World Trade Organization we now we can tackle the subsidies and where the EU, it is a critical partner. So on the list of Helga, I would, I would also like to see more on the cooperation on, on oceans because actually the European Union has been a critical, have a critical footprint, not only in Latin America, but around the world in terms of fisheries and, dri and driving overfishing and driving the extinction of several species. Let's just uh, talk about the sharks. Spain remains to be one of the biggest importers and exporters of the sharks. We know now 90 more than 90% of the species of shark have disappeared and they're critical for a healthy ocean. So not only deforestation, not only overfishing, but also how we not only talk about extractive sort of measures in terms of valuing, but how we actually not taking could be valuable for the, for the ocean. And I, would just, I just want to finish with a, a, a little example of another region that we're, we're, we're working now, which is Patagonia. Patagonia have the biggest extensive 
um, extension of um, kelp forests. We know now uh, that kelp forest is actually the ecosystem that has the highest capturing of carbon um, CO2 on Earth. So we have an incredible opportunity to help Chile and Argentina to actually do better and to help us to solve this crisis. But it only will be if we try to protect the whole ecosystem and not just partially or just by trying to give it a, a new branding use, but actually how we protect those ecosystems fully because those ecosystems are also the nurse of fisheries around the globe, fisheries in the Pacific, which are benefiting the EU, the United States, and the whole planet. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Max. Um, that's that's uh, uh, an important reference to the oceans um, and to to the um, delicate situation of sharks in particular. Indeed, uh, this is a concern for the for the EU. You just to just to add to, to to your to your intervention because I used to work in fisheries in the in the European Union. Uh, in, in the Director General for Maritime Affairs. And there the European Union was one of the first, uh, and, and it still is one of those that proposes systematically in the regional fisheries management organizations to, to do away with, uh, with shark finning, this very wasteful practice of cutting the fin then throwing the, the, the carcass of the, of the sharks. Um, uh, we, we are still very much uh, pushing for, for that. And indeed, there is, there is uh, some, some way to um, to walk still, but uh, we're certainly uh, walking the talk uh, also on, on, this, on this issue. Right, uh, you mentioned something at the beginning that really, uh, that I really liked. Um, you mentioned that for Latin America, the main wealth is, is nature. Uh, in, nature is wealth. And, uh, you know, I'm going to jump over the questions that I had prepared. I'm going to be a bit uh, uh, provocateur here. Um, and, and really, for, for, for the experts that I have with me, I'm going to make the most today. And I'm going to ask any of you or all of you about, OK, so nature is wealth. How do we measure it then? How do we actually, uh, or, or we, do we need to monetize it? How does it appear in natural accountings so that these ministries of finance take this into consideration as a wealth that cannot be squandered? How, how do we go about this? I know it's a big question, but perhaps uh, um, there's some take care of that one. No? <laughs> yeah, I, th I think it, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> take it since uh, nobody is <laughs> seems to put be, you in the spot. No, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm gonna take the, the, the hit. Um, even though I, I don't think I have the, 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 the answer, I think it's a, the transformation is, is absolutely needed, no? I think, um, as I said, um, changing our, our point of view of uh, an extractive, purely extractive, or how we actually um, recognize um, the value by by selling, by taking, by um, by exporting, importing. I think it is important maybe to to see how, um, and, and 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 you know even going further. I think there is momentum here to a different diplomacy. Um, of the EU and the US to see the value of actually protecting through um, helping and cooperating um, even with small communities. Um, I mentioned the case of the of the Patagonia. Um, you know, in Patagonia we have a great issue. The main threat is salmon farming. Um, the US is one of the biggest importers. Um, Brazil, it is too, EU to uh, Japan and others, China, of course. And the, the economy of Patagonia is being basically based, based on, on salmon farming exports in, um, you know, from, from, from this region, which have a huge cost for nature, uh, but also a huge cost for the communities who have no other choices or they have no other parameters. Whatever they try to do, it is basically need to be around salmon farming. And so the whole economy is an extremely vulnerable economy where you have some of the biggest uh, forests on earth. Um, you know, the, the, the Patagonia forest that is being protected by Chile through also donations of private, like Tompkins Conservation, but also, as I mentioned, the kelp forest. 
how do we actually transform our economy, how we actually help through not taking, but actually to give a price or a, a value to something that would have impact in the long term in the Pacific region, in the world, by capturing, by also creating more biomass. Um, by protecting these ecosystems, you will have also more fish. Um, we've seen areas like Mexico being just report um, recently on how much more tuna in the new marine protect area of Revilla y Gedo was, uh, you know, available for the fishermen, which were actually the main people against that marine protected area. Now they have more tuna. Now they have a, a much sustainable and future and a better future. Um, how we actually converse, uh, how do we actually talk between conservation and economy? How we actually talk about blue economy with a big focus on conservation? Because it's not that you go to the ATM, the cash machine, and just take, 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 if you don't put money on your bank. So how we actually invest in ocean that we can actually start talking about sustainable sort of, you know, economy in the end. Uh, thank you, Max. Uh, thank you for, for taking taking the, <laughs> the lead there. Uh, Helga, you wanna mm -hmm. come in? Yeah, I mean, the, the the question of valorizing nature is a very philosophical one and, and one, I guess, one can have really different views. But I think the challenges around measuring biodiversity value is it's really showing in very practical terms all the time and, and the complexity also compared to climate where you have uh, carbon and, and something you can measure in a quite relatively easy way. I mean, now you have a huge biodiversity financing gap globally. The global biodiversity framework sets quite ambitious objectives to close them. I mean, there's a lot of, of commitments on the official development aid side. The EU has, has committed to um, 7 billion for the time till 2027, with also for the first time financing targets across our budgets. So there is progress on that, but it's also clear that, I mean, if, if there's a financing need of 200 billion per year from all sources, that is not going to come from ODA alone. So the question is, how, how do we get other sources? There's philanthropy, but we need, obviously, investors, and how can we make a business case? And I think that's the eternal question, how to do that. I think there are cases and there are projects that are successes on restoration on I mean we now because we have a, a strong focus now on nature restoration we have been working very hard to show this can work this can be a business model but I think it's it's not easy to scale them up um, I think the bank the World Bank has been trying for a long time most development banks have been trying for a very long time to get out of, of small-scale pilot projects and to come to something bigger it's not obvious, and, and that is work in progress that we really have to, to focus on. But then I think then that was mentioned by, by Sophia, I believe. Um, I think other tools from the sustainable finance policy can really help a little bit. I mean, there's still far too little awareness about the risks linked to nature loss in, in businesses. And we have, for example, on our side, strengthened now our reporting requirements for companies. I mean, they have to report much more on their impacts on biodiversity. That brings transparency and that, together with the taxonomy that Sophia has mentioned, can really help direct investments into nature positive action away from the harmful activities. And then in some cases, in particular in developing countries, I think we need a, a complement of, of public support, for example, guarantees for first loss if that's a risky investment environment. I mean, this is not something we can just expect the private sector to do without a little bit of support from the public side. And that is also, we have, for example, a program in, in Colombia where, where the European Investment Bank comes in with, with additional <coughs> guarantees to, to help out in case things don't work out the way they plan in a in a not easy investment environment. So these are a couple of the tools, but it's, it's an extremely difficult question, and, and we see it now, and that's the last point um, in the upcoming discussion around biodiversity certificates. 
it, there's a lot of, of terminological confusion, I think, about uh, biodiversity certificates, biodiversity credits, and so forth. But it always also comes down to the question, like, what's the unity you measure? Like, what would get a certain certificate? It's not like if you reduce by so and so many CO2, you get a certificate that's relatively straightforward. It's far less straightforward for biodiversity, and I think the, the bank, again, is, is working hard on that. We have our research teams looking into that, and many others, I'm sure, do as well, but this is definitely work in progress, and, and for now, we're just not there to, do any, to build up a system that is credible in, in measuring whatever can be achieved on, on biodiversity protection. Thank you so much, Helga. That's that's um, a very interesting overview of, of, of the key the key challenges on that. But I, I, I believe it's an important uh, a very important issue, um, you know, measurement of, of natural capital. Listen, uh, another question for for all of you, um, or for some of you: um, How can the EU and the US work together in all these challenges that we've been going through? Uh, how can the transatlantic relation? work better to, to protect the environment in Latin America and the Caribbean? Or what? The, the negative side is what are we doing wrong? What can we, where can we improve? Uh, so, so there you go. Um, anybody? Oh, Sophia, yeah. Let, let's, um, let's, let's, let's hear from <laughs> Sophia first. Max, Max is very keen always. <laughs> but uh, but let's, 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 let's go to Sophia first. Sophia, the floor is yours. Oh. I cannot find where to raise my hand, sorry. So <laughs> even before I wanted to say something, so it's like just to break the ice as I'm not EU, I'm not US. It's, <laughs> it's easy for me to, 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 to wish for stronger cooperation. And I think it goes in the direction of the previous question, Manuel. It's, uh, and, and this is precisely what also Helge was saying, is that we, we don't really know how to value nature. And without mainstreaming nature and biodiversity into economic decisions, it's going to be impossible. But to do, in th to do that, we need to have the metrics. We need to have uh, to the ability to, to quantify and to include it. So there are different approaches. There are different structures going forward. So I think that the EU and the US could take this leadership in these different initiatives, being taxonomies that are taking biodiversity and nature at large, not only climate. And <laughs> it's true that we feel that climate is easier. I think it's really, really complicated in any case, but nature is even more complex and it's very much related with climate adaptation uh, with uh, resilience. So it's kind of converging with the, these issues and bringing also together the human rights and the social aspects that it's some, somehow sometimes forgotten in the different metrics, the different agendas. So I would like to see a stronger cooperation between the two sides of the Atlantic in all these areas. And, and we have the task force on nature related financial disclosures, for instance, that could be also a good way. ESG, there are many different initiatives. And, uh, and I think that this could really be a game changer. And even joining forces in different programs, funding programs, capacity building program, warranties, etc. So it's like kind kind of promoting this harmonization of different metrics and then um, joining forces and and finance for programs together. I think it will be a great way forward. And I'm sure it's super easy for, for my US and EU colleagues and they could they could take it forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophia. Max, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I think there's there is a great possibility, and we've seen some of these changes. If you look at, for example, the um, Eastern Tropical Pacific again, um, and the Wilson Center actually have been a critical partner on this, um, to see in, um, this last March in the Our Ocean Conference, uh, for the first time I understand the Secretary of Navy, the Secretary of uh, Defense, in the same place outside of the United States. Uh, they were in the conference, in Our Ocean Conference. This is a... This is an, a, a, um, a venue that you would call it a more conservation sort of minded. And, and to see this connection, I think it's, it's been a long way, of course. Uh, but, but I think the US is doing a great work on connecting you know, all the capacity they have in Latin America, not just for some of the uh, key issues um, sort of isolated, but actually as a, as a whole. 
Um, the DFC play an incredible role also in the latest announcement of uh, Equalor uh, dev um, swap, which is the biggest dev swap ever done for nature. Um, over one billion, so actually 1.2 billion dollars, uh, where DFC play an incredible role. Credit Suisse, um, EU-based uh, bank to and um, the IDB uh, also, um, and the partners uh, like uh, Pew Vertarelli and others. No, I think we've seen this incredible cooperation between countries that can can help to understand what is needed. Uh, again, with with a continent like Latin America, where you know there's a lot of leadership for marine conservation. I think investing on how we actually well protect those places. Panama have now 54. 0.3% of protection in the ocean. This is one of the highest after, just after Palau. Uh, Chile is 43% of protection, the 10th biggest economic exclusive um, uh, zone on Earth is actually almost 50% protected. I think seeing these opportunities, seeing how actually EU and the US can cooperate together to help that, because otherwise it's impossible for a country like Ecuador to try to monitor 300 vessels from China fishing right outside of the economic exclusive zone. How are they gonna do it? I mean, the China offer, China offer um, the Ecuador, come and, and, and check our boats that we're not doing. It. Really? How Ecuador is gonna have the capacity to go and check every single boat in which, in which manner? I mean, so these are, these are very controversial, very, important things that where the EU, where the US can actually help the countries. And that would he help dearly. On economy, it will help on stability for the region too. So I think there's a huge invitation here and, and, and a great opportunity for sure. Thank you so much. You, you brought there the security angle as well, which is which is important, particularly in the oceans. Um, you know, where we're monitoring and policy in the oceans is particularly complicated. Helga, you want to take the floor, please. Just two short points. Um, I think research cooperation again is, from my perspective, maybe something where we can still do more on all these issues, ranging from really ways of um, sustainably intensifying agricultural production, restoring degraded lands to the more um, theoretical concepts, or, or not so theoretical, but like how do you valorize, how do you do you measure um, biodiversity values. There's really a whole range where I think more could be done. Um, then I think also in, in areas, for example, on deforestation, I think we agree on the objective of halting all somehow, I mean, we've committed to that in the SDGs, um, but we also, I think the US very much knows and, and shares the view that we need to address this issue of agricultural conversion. Um, now, they may disagree on, on the tool or they may not be at the point of, of being ready to uh, adopt a legislation that is similar to the EU deforestation regulation for many domestic reasons or maybe also conceptual reasons. But if you look at also the response from across the government to the executive order of President Biden where he was asking for views on, on how to move forward on this, I think that shows that there's also a lot of common ground on, on what needs to be addressed and, and where need, support needs to go to move towards more sustainable agricultural production. So if we focus on the overall objectives and um, start by, by seeing where there's common ground towards them, also in cooperation with um, third countries, and there, for example, I think it was really encouraging that in the recent joint statement on climate between the US and China, there's a focus on illegal deforestation, but it is an including on illegal deforestation. So there is an opening with a general commitment to address all forms of deforestation. That's something to build on and where, again, the EU and the US, I think, can, can work together also, also towards others. And then, yeah, that brings me to the G20. And again, I think next year is, is a crucial one, a crucial presidency with, with Brazil on the way also to COP30. And there, I hope we can still um, see more of what we can do together. Thanks. Thank you. Well, we have 10 minutes now left before we need to close this. It's a harsh uh, close, a harsh deadline, as, as far as I understand. So 
Um, I would like to turn to you, to those that have been uh, keen to come here, for those that are online following the, the event. Um, you have any questions to our uh, panelists? I see one question there, please, sir. Thank you. Good morning. Very nice uh, presentations. Uh, I, my name is Ricardo Raineri. I'm an economist uh, from the Catholic University in Chile, former energy minister of Chile. Uh, I have many questions, uh, but uh, many questions. I think uh, it's a very interesting subject. Huh? Uh, on forestation, what about uh, national determined contributions? Because many Latin American countries are contributing uh, reforestation, so how you balance this deforestation with this reforestation in those issues. Uh, on, on the ocean side, uh, Maximiliano mentioned very well that in Latin America, uh, Argentina, Chile, in the south, they have uh, this uh, salmon industry that is key. Uh, and we say, well, uh, nature is wealth. Yes, Latin America is a big exporter of natural resources. Okay, uh, and it will continue to be a big export of natural resources. So I see that uh, one of the biggest challenges uh, that we have in Latin America is how uh, we manage to uh, get money from that uh, resources in a more sustainable way. So what role you see, for example, for technology innovation there? Uh, uh, because how we help the countries to do what they want to do, but in a more sustainable way. Hmm? Yeah, um, well, I think one cannot uh, do a, a simple counting. Okay, I cut here and then I replant there and then we are at zero and then we are good. Because obviously, I mean, the carbon sink function of old growth forests is, is a very different one from replanted forests. So, I mean, there will always be some form of deforestation for purposes of urbanization, of uh, building infrastructure, whatever, that is clear. But on the, the main driver of agricultural conversion, again, I, I do think we need to find a different way forward. This is just not going to help us with any of our objectives if we continue the way we've been doing. And I mean, I think from the European side, I mean, of course, we acknowledge that there is a certain unfairness, if you want, in, in Europe having deforested a lot of our forests in the past. And I mean, we are confronted with these arguments and, and it's hard to counter um, because yes, we've done mistakes in the past, but I think it's, it's just not gonna help anyone by, by countries now continuing in the same way because ultimately that will be to the damage of everyone and it's, it's in particular developing countries who will be the most affected by the impacts of climate change. <laughs> So I think afforestation, reforestation is absolutely key. We do that in Europe. I think um, most other countries are focusing that as well. But again, I, I don't think it's, it's a calculation that can be done on, on here a bit less, here a bit more, and then things are fine. It's, it's just not adding up the math, I'm afraid. Thank you, Fagerdo. I, I think it, um, maybe taking it to the uh, to salmon farming um, example, um, you know, the salmon farming, um, as you might know, the salmons are not even native uh, to, to Chile. Um, but there have been a, an increase of uh, investment for, you know, several decades in, in Chile with a huge um, investment from the state. I mean, there's uh, big subsidies, basically. I think one, one of, the, of the things would be to somehow revert that situation to a much more open sort of decision with the um, local communities, local governments on actually how we can open that discussion, where those subsidies can actually go, than rather just being, um, uh, you know, directly, uh, basically um, negotiated between this, the, 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 the state to the particular sort of uh, owners of, of some of the some of farming. That could open up a bigger discussion on what, where, what people actually want to do and the other opportunities that we are missing. The obvious one would be the tourism, 
Um, today, uh, Patagonia have probably on land one of the highest uh, percentage of protection on Earth. We're talking about around 80%. So, of course, when you have a, a territory that has been mostly protected, you should think about what do we do with that? No, what, How do we actually uh, try to develop something different? Um, and But instead, it's been always, a, again, um, a one particular a very um, uh, impactful industry that has been kind of taking the microphone and, and just not letting anyone to say anything different. Um, so, to, so reconversion of uh, subsidies, I think it could it could help us to have a different conversation. I think looking into other um, mechanisms where um, th this discussion can open, um, you know, different um, scenarios of uh, a different economy uh, for Patagonia. I think uh, you mentioned, Helga, also the, the biodiversity uh, credits. We are actually starting with our organization um, and our team in Patagonia, um, a discussion about that. It's a very new um, thing. So we're, as you said, it, it's, it's very challenging, but we want to capture this uh, opportunity and, and the real value that is not only on the, on, the, on the algae itself, but it's actually what the algae, you know, helps to, to, to maintain. You know, we know now, for example, the acidification is controlled by, by kelp forests, uh, one of the main issues of climate change. Biodiversity itself, you know, many of the fish that actually then can be fish almost in, in New Zealand actually live part of the time in the kelp forests. Um, the, the, main, the main feature is that it's, for example, like the, the, uh, the kingfish the king crabs, sorry, in, in Magallanes depend 100% on, on kelp forests. So that feature will completely, you know, um, be out if they, we, don't, we don't say that. So just to mention that the, this opens incredible opportunities to, to see the, the Patagonia in a different way that we've seen it. Um, making us, again, and, and I want to make sure that I, that I mention this, one activity will make a whole region much more vulnerable and we've seen it before, the, when, when the salmon farming have had crisis, the first people to go is all these people that are unemployed. They, they lose their job. That's the first thing that the industry does. And then the, the situation, the whole situation is much more complex. So how do we actually bring a little bit more of diversity to the economy? I think that would be um, my, my main sort of you know, thought. Thanks, Max. Um, we got like three minutes, so perhaps we are going to close now. Uh, oh, well, just uh, sorry, someone. If you ha if you have a very very quick question, uh, Cesar, please go ahead. Gracias, Rap. Eh, un saludo, Cesar Parra de Colombia. Yo quisiera preguntar. ¿Qué consideran ustedes es importante las fuerzas militares de los países en la protección ambiental y todo lo que allí se da con la deforestación y la misma reforestación, teniendo en cuenta que hay fuerzas militares que tienen la capacidad de reforestar? ¿Qué piensan ustedes de esa integralidad de las fuerzas militares para proteger y apoyar el tema de medio ambiente? I'm going to answer in, in, in a different way, um, not just on reforestation. I think you, you make a, a very good point. There's a lot of capacity there for that. Um, in, in fisheries, is particularly interesting because it's on, on marine conservation. Um, you know, the, the, the Navy of Chile, the, na the, the Navy of Ecuador, they're looking for some particular things, you know, the, the, the issue of narco traffic and many other things. But in the way that they're also doing the same, that same job, they actually can do some other things which are, you know, highlighting the, uh, the issues with illegal fishing and, 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 and other very pressing uh, things. I have to say, I have the best, actually, examples of how Navy in Chile, for example, they've been really amazing partners for marine conservation. They've really been taking it to another level. And I've seen it also in Mexico. I've seen it in, in, in Ecuador. Uh, I think in, in Colombia also, they've been playing an incredible role. 
on on helping to protect uh, the ocean, these new marine protected areas and stuff. I I think you you, you make a, a really good point because I think we can get a lot more of that uh, for the future. Um, just very briefly, I'm really not an expert on the specificities of of Colombia and the, and the conflict there, but I mean I I do think we've seen the as I said before the real the connection in all directions between deforestation and the state of the of the peace process. I mean initially there were certain areas that were not so heavily uh, deforested just because it, they weren't very accessible, so it had a weird effect of of things being more peaceful, that there was actually more deforestation coming in. At the same time, I think, and, and you've mentioned that in the break before, that, I mean, there's also a possibility of creating alternative livelihoods for those who've come from fighting before in the conflict. So I do think there is a, is a very important connection that we maybe haven't understood sufficiently yet, but, um, and I cannot speak to the role of the, of the military exactly in that, but I do think we need to acknowledge how these things are interconnected to find a, a suitable solution in, in a complex conflict like the one in Colombia. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your participation. Uh, thank you to our great panelists. Uh, I think they deserve an applause. Uh, so I'm going to give them one. And well, everything gets to an end. Uh, so, so we need to close this. And for this, we got, uh, we got with us um, uh, Jason Marsak. Uh, is the director of the Adrian Arst Latin American Center at the Atlantic Council. Uh, so welcome, Jason. Thank you very much for being with us. The floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much, Manuel, uh, Helga, Max. Thank you for the incredible participation here in person, and of course, Rafael and, and Sofia virtually. Uh, I have the role of not just closing this event, but actually uh, closing this, this series and this incredible partnership uh, with uh, the Wilson Center, Ben Gadan and his incredible team, Pablo with you and the, and the incredible team at the, uh, at the Embassy of Spain, of course, the EU, EU delegation. The, Spain's presidency of the Council of the European Real Union has really, I think, kicked off incredible new momentum for accelerating Europe's ties with Latin America and the Caribbean. As Ben noted at the onset, throughout November, working together, we held three high-level uh, events focusing on broadening the geostrategic benefits of closer partnership between the EU, US, and Latin America and the Caribbean, capitalizing the opportunities presented by Spain's leadership during its uh, presidency of the Council of the EU. Three events in November. Uh, ben, I'm looking forward to what we're going to do in December, because uh, we got one more month of the, uh, of the yeah. EU presidency. Uh, but we kicked off this the event, this series of events with an, with an event at the Atlantic Council uh, focused on the future of economic partnership between the EU, US, and Latin America and the Caribbean. At that event, we were thrilled to host special presidential advisor for the Americas and former US Senator Chris Dodd, uh, who gave an exclusive readout one business day after the inaugural America's Partnership for Economic Prosperity Summit as part of a broader conversation that really sought to give momentum to accelerate trade and investment frameworks between our regions. Senator Dodd's participation highlighted the U.S.'s commitment to advance inclusive economic prosperity in the region, as well as working closely with like-minded partners such as the European Union. Next, we were thrilled to host uh, the second event uh, here at the Wilson Center, uh, focus, which was an important discussion on strengthening democracy in Latin America, which elevated the contributions of Spain and also last summer's EU CELAC Summit in promoting the shared values that underpin our incredibly important partnership. And then, of course, during today's event, we heard several important points on how the EU, the U.S., and Latin America and the Caribbean can work to, together to support broader environmental conservation and adjust climate change and, and biodiversity. I think today's conversation has really helped us to chart a course for what can look like continued collaboration in this year marked by milestones uh, for, our, th for the, the, our multiple regions, and especially as we look to 2024. Now... As I mentioned, the Spanish presidency of the Council of the European Union will come to a close uh, at the end of December, but I think we really hope and we believe that this moment is opening the door for closer cooperation between the European Union, the U.S., and Latin America and the Caribbean, and I think you can count, continue to count on all of our partners for continued uh, collaboration in that regard, um, especially uh, from the Atlanta Council working closely with Ben and the Wilson Center, the Spanish, Spanish Embassy, and others. So once again, thank you to the Wilson Center for hosting us today uh, and to all of our incredible partners for this uh, series of events throughout the month of November and uh, look forward to December. Thank you all.